Hello, I'm Julie Andrews. Here at the Schubert Theatre, the anthem of the Depression was first performed. Brother, can you spare a dime? From the crash in 1929 to the outbreak of World War II, the Broadway musical kept the troubles of the nation at bay. Along with glamorous stars such as Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly, the musical theater offered political satire and folk opera, bringing hope and comic relief to these desperate times. In an era of yearning dreams, Broadway offered an effervescent antidote to America's darkest days. was a depression, you know. Everybody was trying to make a living. To be working was the main thing. To survive was the main thing. We weren't thinking so much of the art of the theater, believe me. Everybody was working for minimum. And it wasn't altogether bad because people did shows that they wouldn't have done had it been a normal time. The shows in the 20s were escapist things, you know. My first musical that I ever saw was a thing called Hijinks, which was senseless. And most of the musicals of that time didn't reflect life at all. It was a, a kind of an oopsie whoopsie view of life. But when the Depression came, that changed everything. In the kinds of shows that were done, there is much more social commentary. There's much more relationship to the bad times. And I think you'd get that in a song like Brother Can You Spare a Dime. I was working on a sketch for a Broadway review, Americana. On stage, we had men in old soldiers' uniforms waiting around. It needed a song. Yip Harburg. They used to tell me I was building a dream And so I followed the mob When there was earth to plow or guns to bear I was always there right on the job While most popular songs still wanted to pretend that life is just a bowl of cherries, Broadway in the 30s was now open to experiments in form and content. When Bing Crosby recorded Brother Can You Spare a Dime, the doleful Broadway ballad took the hit parade by surprise. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? This song spoke to the hearts and to the minds and to the emotions uh, and thoughts of everybody who lived during that depression. It became the anthem of the early 30s. And at one point it was banned from the radio because it was too potent. But essentially what it was saying was, we built the country, why can't we share in its wealth? The music publishers were total censors of every popular song that came out. Because if you couldn't get it through the music publisher, you couldn't get it out in the street. And uh, they wanted only one thing, love songs and escape songs. The way this got through that censorship thing was because it was in a Broadway show. Broadway was always the bastion of freedom. Uh, for artists in the United States. Oh, say, don't you remember? They called me Al. It was Al all the time. Say, don't you remember? I'm your pal. Buddy, can you spare a dime? 
A song is the pulse of a nation's heart, a fever chart of its health. Are we at peace? Are we in trouble? Do we feel beautiful? Are we violent? Listen to our songs. Yip Harburg. In 1930, a brassy 21-year-old talent first stepped into the spotlight. She would become the emblem of Broadway, the woman who could hold a note as long as the Chase Manhattan Bank. Hit it, babe. Ah! Ethel Merman. She had a voice like a trumpet, and you could hear every word she said. She had a kind of um, good humor on the stage. She was uh, larger than life. Hang it up! Hang it up! Hang it up! Yeah! She was born Ethel Zimmerman to Scottish-German parents in Astoria, Queens, and started singing in her church choir. She never took voice lessons. Instead, learned shorthand and worked as a stenographer at BK Vacuum Booster Break. After work, she sang in clubs and ended up on the vaudeville circuit, where she changed her name to fit the marquee. Her big break came when she was cast in Girl Crazy, which featured music and lyrics by George and Ira Gershwin. What struck George and Ira as riotous was the fact that when Ira wrote additional lyrics, I took them down in shorthand. I didn't see what was so funny. What could have been more natural? I'd been a secretary, hadn't I? Ethel Merman. October 14, 1930, was opening night at the Alvin Theater. Ethel Merman's first number was the eighth song of the evening. No one had ever heard anything like her. I got rhythm, I got music, I got my man who could ask for anything more. I got Daisy in green pastures. The audience went berserk. And at intermission, George Gershwin visited Merman in her dressing room. Ethel, he asked, do you know what you're doing? No, I replied. Well, he advised me, never go near a singing teacher and never forget your shorthand. The first production to open on Broadway in the 1930s was also a Gershwin show, a reworking of an anti-war satire called Strike Up the Band. The original had closed out of town in Philadelphia in 1927. But with the onset of the Great Depression, a musical comedy that poked fun at politics was now welcome on Broadway. The success of Strike Up the Band 
led the Gershwin brothers and writers George S. Kaufman and Maury Riskind to write a new show that was as funny as the government, but not nearly as dangerous. Of the I Sing satirized the American political system with a sing-song patter reminiscent of Gilbert and Sullivan. I saw of the I Sing so many times, I can't tell you when I first saw it. Nobody ever did a satire on politics and got away with it. I mean, you don't know what those musicals were like in those days. People came on in groups, and they sang a song, and they told a joke, and they went off, and that was a book. <laughs> and there was no book to speak of. But of the I Sing was a book, and it had a story and it had great ideas, and it was wonderful. The plot lampooned the ineptitude of Congress, the self-importance of the Supreme Court, and the total irrelevance of Vice President Alexander Throttlebottom. The humor of that show still resonates. It still tells you something when you poke fun at the vice president and you poke fun at love and sex in the White House, subjects that have not exactly left us. Now, Mr. President, what do you have to say for yourself? Impeach me, find me, jail me, sue me. My Mary's love means much more to me. Enough, enough, we want no preachman. It's time to vote on his impeachment. It's time to vote on his impeachment. The senator from Minnesota. Guilty. Check. In the spring of 1932, based on its book and lyrics, Of the I Sing became the first musical to win the Pulitzer Prize. While the fictional president, John P. Wintergreen, entertained the public at the Music Box Theater, a Democratic governor from New York, Franklin D. Roosevelt, was elected president. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is Fear itself. There was a color line that existed on Broadway. It didn't get broken for many, many years because the tradition was that black performers should stay in vaudeville or they should stay in minstrel shows or they can do jazz numbers and they can do this, but we don't mix the two races. That was the way it was. It was a, it was a rule. I don't know who made the rule, but it was a rule. Ethel Waters started her career as a teenager, billed as Sweet Mama Stringbean. Beginning in 1927, she would star in all black Broadway shows like Africana, The Blackbird's Review, and Rhapsody in Black, where she made an astonishing $2,500 a week.
Ethel Waters was a big star on black circuits, and she didn't want anyone telling her how to run her act. She wasn't going to do minstrelsy. She wasn't going to play to certain kind of stereotypes. She's always got enormous amounts of what would then be called race pride. When she introduced Stormy Weather in 1933 at the Cotton Club in Harlem, Waters imbued the music with the weight of her own life story. Don't know why there's no sun up in the sky, stormy weather. Since my man and I ain't together. Ethel came into the world around 1900 after a man raped her mother at knife point and was reared in a Philadelphia ward so poor and violent it was known as the Bloody Eighth. But singing was her escape. I can't get my poor self together. I'm weary all the time. I can't read music. Never have. My music is all queer little things that come into my head. I feel these little trills and things deep inside of me, and I sing them that way. Ethel Waters. After seeing her nightclub performance, Irving Berlin hired her for his next Broadway review. Berlin was now teamed with the talented young writer Moss Hart, and together they used the structure of a newspaper with its headlines, gossip, and comic strips as the basis for a new show. The review, which had been very light and entertaining in most cases through the 20s, was becoming sharp and politically aware. And Irving Berlin had decided fittingly, given the 30s and this political consciousness that was making its way into popular culture, that he wanted to do a timely review. So he conceived of this as the songs would, each song would be attached to a newspaper headline. There were lots of sketches and lots of songs, and that's what Berlin liked. He was very suspicious of the book musical, or as he called it, the situation show. But give him a review with different songs and different skits, and he was in, in heaven, as he would say in his own song. Ethel Waters, in one show, portrayed everything from an exotic Caribbean dancer who started a heat wave by letting her seat wave to a distraught Southern woman singing a lament called Supper Time after her husband has been lynched. The brick wall on the back of the theater was the first set the entrance of Ethel Waters, this monumental woman had a bandana on her head. She had an apron on. The curtain closes behind her. Behind her was the silhouette of a man hanging from a tree with his head on the side, with the rope around his neck. We didn't know in those days about lynchings in the South. It was very unbelievable that they did it in the first place because you didn't you didn't bring in reality into a, into a musical comedy or a review. It was unheard of. She came forward with the beat of that orchestra, this funk of hers. Oh, and an outspotting, and she went into it, and this woman went, Supper time, I must set the time. Supper time. Somehow I ain't able cause that man of mine ain't coming home no more. Supper. will soon be yelling for their supper time. How I keep from telling them that 
man of mine. If one song can tell the whole tragic history of a race, Supper Time was that song. In singing it, I was telling my comfortable, well-fed, well-dressed listeners about my people. Plant trees in the polo grounds and put Yorkville out of bounds. But please, don't monkey with Broadway. Close the village honky-tonks, suppress cheering in the Bronx. But please, don't monkey with Broadway. Think what names used to dance on this road of romance. Think what stars used to stroll along it all day. Made City Hall a skating rink and push Wall Street in the drink. But please, please, I beg on my knees, don't monkey with old Broadway. To a person who has talent and is willing to work hard, Broadway in New York is as friendly as Main Street in my hometown, Peru, Indiana. Cole Porter. Cole Porter was an enigma to many people. Sophisticated, urbane, dirty. He was determined to become a Broadway writer. He wanted to be like Irving Berlin. He wanted to be like Jerome Kern. At the same time, he was rich and idle and a playboy and liked to be on the Riviera and liked his nice apartment in Paris. So he tried to have both worlds at once, and he got it. In the gloom of the Depression, Cole Porter offered Broadway audiences an escape to a world of refined wit and luxury. A rich Midwestern Episcopalian with a degree from Yale, Porter wrote both music and lyrics. His effervescent songs were a tonic to the struggling nation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our own version of Cole Porter's Begin the Begin. small man with big brown eyes, not a poor boy. His grandfather left in the state of $9 million all in cash because he didn't trust stocks and bonds. But anyway, Cole was in Paris in 1919 after the war, looking quite sharp. And he met Linda Lee Thomas, this uh, divorced woman who said to have been the most beautiful woman in Europe. And when the opportunity arrived to marry uh, Cole Porter, uh, the fact that he was homosexual and that there would be a, that it would be what is called a white marriage didn't disturb her at all. Though he was prominent in high society, Cole wanted popular acclaim. And in 1928, he found it with a show called Paris. And the song that did it was Let's Do It. The dragonfly in the reed, do it. Sentimental centipede, do it, lad, do it, lad, fall in love. Mosquitoes, heaven forbid, do it. So does every Katie did, do it, lad. Do Cole it, Porter lad, wrote based partly on Browning and partly on uh, Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, the, the most delectable uh, rhymes. Uh, rhyme after rhyme after rhyme, and also light-hearted. You're the top. You're Mahatma Gandhi. You're the top. You're Napoleon Brandy. You're the purple light of a summer night in Spain. You're the National Gallery. You're Garbo Salary. You're cellophane. You're a knight. In the streets of Cairo, you're a flight in an auto 
gyro. I'm the lazy hound that hangs around the shop. Oh. But if baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top. If I were looking for one show to represent the 1930s, it would be Anything Goes. Book by Lindsay and Krauss. Songs by Cole Porter. Starring Ethel Merman, William Gaxton, Victor Moore. And an incredible Porter score. You're the top, tells people, in 1934. Yeah, we're all feeling lousy, but now maybe it's time to feel a little better. And we sort of think about the show and that song as a sort of civilized embodiment of the Roosevelt recovery. But if baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top. Night and day, you are the one. Only you beneath the moon and under the sun. Whether near to me or far, it's no matter, darling, where you are, I think of you. Night and day. In 1932, in the Broadway show Gay Divorce, Fred Astaire sang Porter's hit, Night and Day. Two years later, he performed the song again in his first starring film role, this time with Ginger Rogers. In the silence of my lonely room, I think of you. Night and day. Fred Astaire was the ideal conveyor of the Cole Porter attitude toward life. He was so debonair. What a dude he was, and how immaculately uh, his little body put on those clothes. He could utter with perfect conviction what Cole Porter gave him to utter. Glamour was part of the balm of the Depression. It was part of the dream. When the culture is collapsing around you, glamour is very persuasive. And it's about hope, isn't it? It's about belief. It's about making something irresistible. In the 1930s, when people felt the anguish and pain of the economic privation, it's ironic, isn't it, that Cole Porter, a man who was wealthy and sophisticated, could reach people in a way that other people couldn't. Cigarette? We used to go to Harlem, George Gershwin and I, sometimes in what the song says, in ermine and pearls, all dressed up, you know. He was always received like an honored guest. And everybody adored George because of who he was and what he was. Most of the time I knew him, he was working on Porgy and Bess. And this was a very big project and an enormous undertaking. And so he talked a great deal about it. I used to go up to his apartment he would say, come on up, and maybe you could sing a couple of bars of summertime and help me with the orchestration. And I did that until I figured out that this was a ploy. The way other men said, come on up and see my etchings, he said, come on up and help me with my orchestration. <laughs> In his most ambitious work for Broadway, George Gershwin set out to create an opera, but one that would appeal to the many rather than the cultured few. Gershwin called it a folk opera. He was a man of his time, and artists in the 30s were going back to the roots of American culture, the, the land, the, the ordinary people, digging into rural life and the common folk. Gershwin's inspiration for this experiment 
had come from DuBose Hayward's best-selling novel, Porgy. It followed a painful love story of a crippled black man in a southern tenement. Gershwin and Hayward went down to Folly Island, South Carolina, to soak up the musical ambiance there. As we sat listening to their spirituals, to George, it was more like a homecoming than an exploration. The Gullah prides himself on what he calls shouting. This is a complicated rhythmic pattern beaten out by feet and hands At a Negro meeting on a remote sea island, George started shouting with them, and eventually, to their huge delight, stole the show from their champion shouter, DuBose Hayward. I decided against the use of original folk material because I wanted the music to be all of one piece. Therefore, I wrote my own spirituals and folk songs but they are still folk music. George Gershwin. You is my woman now. You is, you is. And you must laugh and sing and dance for two instead of one. I had an appointment to sing for him. To my surprise, got off the elevator he opened the door, and it was he. In an all-white uniform, white clothes. And I said, I'm Todd Duncan, and he said, I'm George Gershwin. It was on that day that after I sang just a part of an old Italian song, uh, aria, just part of it, he looked up and he said, will you be my porgy? Under the direction of Reuben Mamoulian, and with Ira Gershwin providing lyrics for songs like It Ain't Necessarily So, the production opened at the Alvin Theatre on October 10, 1935, to an audience that included both drama and music critics. John Mason Brown, New York Evening Post. It is a Russian who has directed it, two Southerners who have written its book, two Jewish boys who have composed its lyrics and music, and a stage full of Negroes who sing and act it to perfection. The result is one of the far-famed wonders of the melting pot, the most American opera that has yet been seen or heard. That's a folk opera. That's an absolute opera, as far as I'm concerned. And when it's done on Broadway, it's a Broadway show. Uh, this is my favorite. I mean, you know, that's, that's, I think there's Porgy, and then I think there's everything else. DuBose Hayward's lyrics are the best lyrics ever written, I think, for the musical stage. They're true poetry, but the music doesn't overblow them, and it only enriches them, and they enrich the music, too. My man's gone now. Summertime. Genuinely poetic.
Critical reaction was mixed, prompting an ongoing debate over Gershwin's interpretation of African-American culture. Well, I'd like to know what is a black man's opera? In the first place. I mean, he wrote an opera about black people. But that's Gershwin's idea of black people. And it's perfectly valid. The mark in terms of race of a major piece of art in America is not that it masters race. You know, bad word, um, bad verb. It's not going to do that. It's that in some way it is tangling with it and reflecting and showing, you know, those schisms and those contradictions. And I think by those lights, um, it is certainly a major work of art, and at times, particularly thanks to Gershwin, it's a great piece of art. Though it played for 124 performances in its premiere production, Gershwin's folk opera was a financial failure. It would take many years for the work to achieve landmark status. Porgy and Bess was the last thing Gershwin ever wrote for the Broadway stage. On July 11, 1937, George Gershwin died of a brain tumor at the age of 38. The writer, John O'Hara, lamented, George Gershwin died today, but I don't have to believe it if I don't want to. Among the many job programs created by the government's Works Progress Administration was the Federal Theater. Intended to provide work for those in show business, it also supplied much needed entertainment that reached 25 million people, a quarter of the population. In the fall of 1936, in a time of misery and despair, 18 million unemployed in the country, Orson Welles and I formed WPA Project 891, also known as the classical unit of the Federal Theatre. And our third production was a new musical described by its author and composer Mark Blitzstein as a labor opera. While we were rehearsing The Cradle Will Rock, it became evident that this was a very hot property. It was about the rise of the CIO. It was about a steel strike. It was about the conflict between the establishment and the new forces within the labor movement. And very soon, it dawned upon the WPA authorities that with Blitzstein's opera, we had a tiger by the tail. Joe Worker gets chipped For no good reason, just chipped From the start until the finish comes They feed him out of garbage cans They breed him in the slums Joe Worker will go To shops where stuff is on show He'll look at the bread, and too little to eat sort of goes to the head. One big question inside me cries, how many bakers, peace 
undertakers, paid strike breakers, how many toiling, ailing, dying, piled up bodies, rather does it take to make you wise? Three days before our premier, a dozen uniformed WPA security guards invaded the Maxine Elliott Theatre. Well, someone wanted to make sure that that play didn't open. Someone was afraid of it. Someone decided to go to the theater and lock it. And uh, nine times out of 10, that would have worked. But they didn't count on the fact that uh, Orson Welles was the director and John Hausman was the producer. And those are two incredibly strong, powerful personalities not only believed in their artistic and creative rights, but also in America and what it is to be free in America and what freedom of expression really means. The opening night crowd was led 20 blocks uptown to a new theater. But the cast and musicians were strictly prohibited from performing by both the government and their respective unions. Orson Welles brought composer Mark Wittstein on stage to play the score. Mark Wittstein. And he told the actors that there was nothing to stop them from speaking their lines from the audience as citizens exercising free speech. And in the next two hours, all the actors in the cast, with one or two exceptions, stood in the house, stood in boxes, stood in the aisles, ran around, changed their positions, uh, sang songs, duets, separated by the whole width of the theater, did all kinds of extraordinary pieces of improvisation. And the net result of this was one of the most thrilling and extraordinary uh, world premieres uh, I've ever been at or anyone has e ever been at. And that is how The Cradle of the Rock was born. In standing up, those actors were risking everything. And when we say everything, you gotta remember, this was a time before Social Security before unemployment insurance, before welfare. If you lost your job, that was it. These people, in doing what they did, were really creating a huge image of courage. Think of the Rogers and Hart shows of the 20s and 30s. Ridiculous little stories. But the songs, the songs were thrilling. Articulate, witty, personal, intimate, heart-wrenching. Those depressing and depression years, and they were supplying the art, the, the lyrics and, and the music for a desperate population. It seems we stood and talked like this before. We looked at each other in the same way then, but I can't remember where or when. The clothes you're wearing are the clothes you wore. And the smile you are smiling, you were smiling then, but I can't remember. Larry Hart in his lyrics, was trying to get more deeply into the human experience. And Rogers was there to accommodate him with the melodies that italicized the words. That's what we'll remember Rogers and Hart for. And so it seems that we have met before And laughed before And loved before But who knows where when? 
the Depression really wiped out so much of everything. Many of us weren't doing a doggone thing because it was starvation time. Let's rent a theater dark and invite all the producers. That'll be great. Well, everybody thought it was a great idea, except that we rented the theater with one bulb on stage, the work light, and nobody came. Except at the end of it, a tall man came over to me and he said, come with me to the uh, Barrymore Theater. And I went, and this boy said, can you sing old, sing any ordinary, regular song, like Tea for Two or something? And I said, I, 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 I don't know if I know the lyrics. He said, well, I'll throw them to you, come on. Tea for Two, and I sang along with Richard Rogers. <laughs> I didn't know who it was. I didn't know it was George Abbott. It was Richard Rogers, Larry Hart. I didn't even know who they were at that time. And I got the job. The show was Pal Joey, and it marked a real departure for the songwriting team of Rogers and Hart and their director, George Abbott. Based on the stories of John O'Hara, Pal Joey dispensed with the innocent optimism of the traditional musical comedy. Tawdry nightclub routines framed the story of an affair between a wealthy married woman and a sleazy gigolo. <laughs> I got to sing and dance. I had this long sequin dress cut down to there, and he sang, I'm a red hot mama, but I'm blue for you. And the lights changed as I said blue and green. <laughs> Pal Joey was an unusual event in uh, Broadway history. This was a show that wasn't sort of light and airy and amusing. It is a weird sort of enterprise. None of the characters have even a bowing acquaintance with decency. It seemed time to us, however, that the musical comedy start looking at the facts of life. Richard Rogers. Only the charm of the leading actor made his character's amoral behavior acceptable. The star of Hal Joy is Gene, Gene Kelly. He was playing a very good character for himself, a very brash, cocky person who was very randy for girls. He was very young, he wasn't yet 30. He was an energetic, fresh, aggressive, Irish-American presence, which had a great charm. The book was taken seriously with Rogers and Hart, and, and uh, pal Joey was really revolutionary in its time. They did a remarkable job in, in turning the musical theater into a serious art form. Beguiled again, a simpering, whimpering child again, bewitched, bothered, and bewildered am I. Pal Joey had no happy ending. The characters simply walked off the stage in opposite directions. Within three years, Rogers and Hart would go in opposite directions as well, ending a partnership that had lasted over two decades. The evolution of the musical into a more sophisticated art form would have to wait until Richard Rogers found a new partner in the midst of the Second World War. a date which will live in infamy. The entry of the United States into World War II galvanized the country, and Irving Berlin 
who had created a rousing army review during the First World War, was asked by the government to rally the troops again. This is the army had a cast composed of real soldiers, and the proceeds from the performances went to the Army Emergency Relief Fund. Many of the performers juggled rehearsal schedules with weapons training. A typical day might involve dancing in the morning, firing rifles in the afternoon, and dressing up as a woman at night, all with the approval of the US Army. On opening night, almost 2,000 people were packed into the Broadway theater. It was July 4th, 1942, the first July 4th of the war. Crowds in the street outside, packed lobby full of the usual first-nighters, but also a lot of big brass. People up from Washington. I'd never been to a first night before. I was 15 years old. Uh, so this was a pretty thrilling first first night to have. And I can remember the excitement in this audience just before it ever started. And then the curtain opens and there are 300 young men in uniform on bleachers delivering the opening chorus. And it builds from there. Soldiers, these wonderful soldiers, singing new Irving Berlin songs, doing funny skits, being marvelous. And already in the intermission, the buzz in the theater was extraordinary. This was Irving Berlin's best show yet. And then towards the end of the second act, my father himself came out on stage. There he was in his World War I uniform, and he sang with that true, frail voice, a little nervous at first. I've you quite a while, and I would like to state the life is simply wonderful, the army food is great. I sleep with 97 others in a wooden hut. I love them all, they all love me. It's very lovely, but... And then beginning to pick up and tapping, you know, beating his hat. Uh, against his leg for the rhythm, really delivering it. And step upon it heavily and spend the rest of my life in bed. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I love to remain in bed. For the hardest blow of all is to hear the bugle call. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up this morning. The show played 112 performances on Broadway before touring the country and being adapted for Hollywood. Women were added to the cast and supporting talents were enlisted, including Lieutenant Ronald Reagan. We're going on tour. What do you know, Boston, Philadelphia, Washington? Washington? Hey, wouldn't it be something if the president came to see us? The chief himself. When the show toured overseas, Irving Berlin served as America's troubadour, performing in hospitals and near the front lines. In 1943, as soldiers shipped out of New York for the fight in Europe, they saw a new kind of Broadway show. A show that integrated songs with story and dance a show that would remind them what they were fighting for.